please join me in welcoming David Kessler. But I distilled it down, I boosted it out a little with some pages around it, and I sent it around, and I got an editor to buy it as a book. Early on, he saw the problems with having 100 pages of pure ideas thrown on a reader, and, and I do too. So I suggested to him, you know what happened the same summer that I, that I wrote this manifesto? I went down a river for a magazine article, the Charles River, with this guy named Dan Driscoll, who was very funny and, and, uh, and had, had, as I said earlier, greeted the banks. What if we embody the ideas, even though it's a little false, why don't, you know, it's like we've got the river trip here and the intellectual trip here, what if we smush them together? And he said, ah, oh, you know, I don't really like that. Uh, seven months later, he said to me, what if we take the ideas and, and we smush them together and make one book? And I said, that's a good idea. As he paddles, Dan describes what he calls his radical idea that being environmental isn't about education or politics. It's about what Thoreau called contact, falling in love with something, a place, an animal, and then fighting for it. When I grew up in Newton, we always had our butts dragged out to Lincoln to learn about nature. The way I look at it, if one kid walks out into his own backyard and has contact with nature, then maybe that'll do something. Maybe he'll be inspired to fight for the place. Maybe he'll be the next John Muir. He pauses to correct his exaggeration. Or at least maybe he'll just be less of a dick. <laughs> and, you know, as he's saying stuff like this, I'm like, oh God, please keep going. <laughs> this is my wildness. A trashy ditch with a hooker boot for Florida. Maybe that's a good thing. Sometimes I don't think people value wildness because they believe they have to hike to the top of a mountain in Alaska to find it. I've traveled all over the world to experience the wild, but some of my wildest moments have been closer to home. On Cape Cod, on the same domestic beach I've returned to all my life, where the summer is all kids, umbrellas, and beach balls, the winter cold clears it of people, and its character changes. From the rocks at the end of the beach, I once watched hundreds of snow-white gannets dive from 100 feet in the air, plunging into the freezing winter ocean like living javelins. Then as the birds dove down, something else dove up, a breaching humpback whale rising as it herded the same fish the gannets were diving for. In wildness is the preservation of the world, wrote Thoreau. But as many others have pointed out, people often get the quote wrong and use wilderness instead. While wilderness might be untrammeled land along the Alaskan coast, wildness can happen anywhere. Wildness is unplanned, unpredictable. You can't put a fence around it. It can happen in the jungle or on a city river. It rises up when you least expect it. It's of vital importance that we not define this wildness as wilderness, that we not construct intellectual walls between the natural and the human. In fact, it was while observing my own species, my own family, that I experienced the two wildest moments of my life. The first came while holding my father's hand while he died. I listened to his final breaths, first deep and then gasping and fish-like, and I gripped his hand tight enough to feel the last pulsings of his heart. Something rose up in me that day, something deep, animal, unexpected, something that I didn't experience again until my daughter Hadley was born nine years later. Before her birth, everyone warned me that my life was about to change. The implication being that it would become tamer. But there was nothing tame about those 24 hours in the hospital or that indelible moment after the C-section when the doctor reached into my wife up to his elbows and a bloody head emerged straight up, followed by Hadley's full emergence and a wild squall of light as her little arms rose over her head in victory. Sure, the surge was physiological, goosebumps and tingling scalp and a hundred other physical symptoms. But it was more than that, too. A wild rush, both a loss of and a return to self. These moments of death in life, as much as any moments in pristine nature, reconnect us to our primal selves, remind us that there is something wilder lurking below the everyday, that having tasted wildness, 
we return to our ordinary lives, both changed and charged. So while I'll continue to seek out and protect wild places, I do so knowing that I don't need to travel to the Amazon or Everest to experience the ineffable. It is on that same Cape Cod beach where I first walked holding my mother's hand, near the waters where I later spread my father's ashes, that I learned that my wildest moments are often closest to home. And, is there, and it is there that I now bring Hattie each summer, secretly hoping that the wild will rise up in her when she least expects it. Thank you.